Welcome back to the workshop. Watch out, fun is dead ahead. We are given a wonky antique a gorgeous to see in episode six. Let's give this car some wings today. Yep, it's going to be aerodynamic and stick like glue to the racetrack. And today's episode has three parts, just like the last one. First of all, we're going to work a little bit on the cars. Then we're going to check out and see what happened at Riverside in 1965 that will jump in and work on the Riverside car. Sound like a plan? Let's get to it. We are going to trim off the extra on the driver's leg. Remember, it's going to be just a little bit longer so it doesn't show that it's been hacked off indiscriminately by the Cox people. So that little floor detail was done, but later in the episode, we're going to redo it, make it even better. The rest of this episode is going to be dedicated exclusively to the Riverside race at 1965, where the Chaparral team did win. However, a little shocker here, the car that we are reproducing was not the winner. It was part of the winning team, but it actually pulled out of the race because of problems with the rear suspension. However, it was the most advanced of the cars, and I think the coolest one. So that is the one we're reproducing today, the awesome 1965 Chaparral 2C. The Chaparral cars of the day were extremely successful and they changed almost every race. One thing Jim Hall found out as he kept going in the race series, control of air was incredibly important along with horsepower. You'll see that these Chaparral 2s, as they continued to evolve, as Jim Hall added more intakes and exits for the air to improve the aerodynamics. A little side note here, the TV show that had just been introduced and was a sensation at the time was Batman. As we continue to work on this car today, you'll see this car is starting to really, really look like the Batmobile with all of the aerodynamics. It was really unusual for the time and it was really made fun of when Jim Hall and Hap Sharp showed up with this car. People said, what in the world is going on? It had a fiberglass chassis instead of aluminum chassis. It looked more like an airplane than it looked like a car. But you know, as the years went on, everybody copied what was going on in the Chaparral team because they were so incredibly dominant for about four years between 1965, 1968, 1969. So as we're cutting the rear vents, notice how thin the plastic gets at the back of this injection mold. We're first hogging out those little vents. Notice that there was a little break here because that material is so thin. No problem. We went in from the back, put a little piece of styrene, then filled in with a little bit of Tamiya putty. That's one thing about working with these 50-year-old survivors. Just about anything can be fixed. Don't worry about it. Now, we have to remove these fender skirts. Remember, those fender skirts were gone after the 2A. They were pretty much smooth slab sides at that point. So, we take these things down just using a rotary tool and a little sanding wheel. Notice that the sandpaper itself keeps kind of dipsy doodling back and forth. I'm doing a little bit of sanding ballet. Let's go to Riverside 65. This is the Los Angeles Times Grand Prix. Just announced is the surprise withdrawal of Jim Hall and the Chaparral 2C. The trouble, rear end suspension. The Chaparral team will go with only one car. Half Sharp will be at the wheel, starting eighth on the grid. The flag is ready. They're moving the problem car off, and there's the start. Fourth is the Chaparral of Half Sharp. Followed by Fernelli Jones, Graham Hill, and Bruce McLaren. 103.2 miles per hour. He's making good use of that movable spoiler. Sharp's fastest lap is 127.3. Sharp rounds turn nine on the last lap. He'll never be caught now. The jubilant Chaparral team with leader Jim Hall is rushing to the rail to wave Sharp in. Sharp takes the checker in record time. One hour, 56 minutes and 28 seconds. Average speed, 102.989 miles per hour. A familiar scene in Victory Lane, Jim Hall, Half Sharp, and the Chaparral. Man, is that cool. You know, I was just a little kid back then when that race ran. But wouldn't it be fun to be back in those times? Men were real men. Women were real women. And racing against people like Ken Miles, Dan Gurney, and Carol Shelby must have been really scary. All right, so here's what we're going to do on the floor. Did you see that there was actually a cushion over on the opposite, the passenger side of this car? So being able to recreate that little cushion is going to help us fill in that little section of the floor that needs to give way 
for the chassis to kind of poke up through. And this is much more successful than the previous version. First of all, I'm using a thinner styrene and I'm also ending the right and left sides of this filler piece right at the seats. Can you see that? After we put this thing into place on both cars, it's very hard to even notice that it's there once you spray it with primer. You know, that's one thing about this series. I will show you my initial work, and then if I decide to replace it, I'll show you that too, because this is kind of an iterative approach uh, to rebuilding these things and making them better than they were. Some things are gonna work, some things are not gonna work. But look, as we spray these with primer, that seat begins to look like it really belonged there in the first place. That cushion gives a nice transition into that fill piece. If you can get a hold of that to me, a primer that I've been using, that stuff is really, really excellent. It's thin, so you can use many, many coats, and it is filling over those many coats. The best materials can really help you make the best models. All right, let's add wings. The cool thing about the Chaparral 2C, there were front air foils, and that was also the beginning of the rear spoilers that you saw on cars. These were unusual at the time, but just a few years later, everyone had them. So today, if you have a spoiler on your passenger car, thank you, Hal Sharp. Thank you, Jim Hall. <laughs> you did a great job. A big concern about putting airfoils like this on a car, especially one that moves around a track like a slot car, they got to be strong and you really can't do a butt joint on styrene to styrene here. It's just not going to be strong enough. Really, the only way that I've found to be able to do this successfully is to use aluminum for these airfoils and to make sure that you slot those airfoils. That's the reason I've cut that slot into the cars at strategic locations. Now, as you cut aluminum you're going to get kind of depressed because it really bends and you think I've ruined it. No, no, no. Just take a little planishing hammer and flatten it back out again. Then use your files to really do the final fitting and a little bit of sanding from your rotary tool. You can get these things matched to fit perfectly onto this profile. Again, I suggest using templates because that's going to get you there a lot faster. Then use sandpaper to smooth those edges. Making these parts really nice and smooth are what's going to sell these airfoils as being the real thing. If you have jagged edges, it's not going to work. Smooth those things out before you glue them into place. If it looks like I'm slowing down a little bit right here, it's because I am. You really got to get the positioning of these front airfoils to look correct, and you have to match them between the right and left sides. If you get one off, it's not going to look good, and the guy's going to fly off the track and he's going to die. It's not, it's not good. So you can see here, we're getting them both in just the right spot before I add the glue. And here you're gonna need that kicker right away. Use a lot of glue here. I mean, really pour it into place because as it solidifies, it's gonna really put these in rock solid. But these things are strong once they're in place. You don't have to worry about them breaking off because they are really embedded in the material. Make sure these wings are really fitted nicely before you glue them in. Then you won't have to use very much putty to blend them into the surface. Remember, they're not really blended. These things were just attached much the same way. They were reinforced. Now, when you put these vertical stanchions into place in the rear, you're going to think, is this really the way it is? This thing looks just like the Batmobile. Well, it really is the way it was designed. Once you put that spoiler into place, it's gonna look like it's supposed to. But right now, yeah, it looks like it's ready to take off from an airport. If you can locate one of those old cast iron pair of scissors, that's the way to cut this stuff because it doesn't use a serrated edge much like metal cutters would. I don't think the newer scissors that have the plastic handles are strong enough really to, to take care of aluminum like this. Look for some old stuff to cut. Oh yeah, I can feel it. It's a sense of accomplishment. It's a sense of good craftsmanship that's going all over your body right now. Yes, nice. So after we spray this car with a little bit of Tamiya primer, I now truly believe that this car will travel from the depths of depravity to something gorgeous. My name is Doug and I will be here for the next episode. I hope you are too.